Father, to give us to His Son, our Father. St. John the Beloved, Prophets of Phoenix, Strength of Son. Amen. I was going to introduce Dr. Clark to you today um, with, you know, great things about his past, of which I know nothing, because I met him tonight. So uh, I am as interested to find out what he has to say as you are, and um, I will let him give his own introduction. It's a great honor for us to welcome Dr. Clark tonight. Here are some keys to me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all for having me. Uh, I have to say I'm pretty much blown away by uh, by the program here. I walked in, I saw these posters, I thought, my goodness gracious. I was telling Sabatino last year, we were in California last year. I was I was a tutor at Thomas Aquinas College. I've been there for six years or so, and I was invited to give a talk at this. There's a speaker series down at Holy Spirit Parish, Holy Spirit Parish in Atlanta, sort of an epicenter of Catholic intellectual life in Atlanta. And I thought, I don't know how many people came to that talk, but I was impressed. There were maybe 30 or 40 people, and I thought, wow, we've got a great thing going here. And I asked Sabatino tonight, I said, so how many are we going to get? I thought he was going to say seven, eight, maybe nine. <laughs> he said, I was, I was blown over. And then looking at these posters, it's uh, it's really wonderful. So I I, uh, uh, I wish that my family and I were a little bit closer so we could attend all these. Um, I'm supposed to talk about Newman and conversion, which is uh, 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 a topic near and dear to my own heart. Now, I'm not going to bore you with personal observations for very long. But I will say this. Um, I had... Uh, I was. I came back to the Catholic Church because of Newman, and uh, my oldest son, uh, John Henry, is named for Newman. Uh, I was at Columbia University where I was studying medieval history. I'm a medieval historian, really a historian of medieval theology. That's my specialty. You should be thankful. And I'm not going to speak to you about my specialty. And start putting up manuscripts and paleography and stuff like that. That would be terrible. We'll soon be down to seven. But I was there, and uh, I was, let's see, it was the mid 90s uh, uh, that I was there, and I was, as I said, very far removed from, uh, from the Catholic Church. And, but I had, there was a volume on my shelf. It was actually this volume. I've since had it rebound. You can tell this is a well thumbed volume. <clears throat> Newman's Plain and Parochial Sermons. And I, what I was looking for, I was looking to read something at night in English. Right, I'm just, every language that I was reading, there was no, I wasn't reading English ever. I was reading mostly Latin, a lot of German, a lot of French. And so I was looking for something in English. And uh, I had heard that Newman was, I knew that he was the master Victorian stylist. I knew that he was sort of the apogee of, of Victorian prose. I also knew that he was a great, a great figure uh, theologically in the 19th century. And I thought, what harm can it do to, uh, <laughs> to pick Newman off the shelf? And uh, boy, I'll tell you, I started reading. So the first two sermons in here, now mind you, these are sermons written by Newman the Anglican. This is before Newman became a Catholic. So I opened it up, and the first one was, the first one says, holiness necessary for future blessedness. Okay? <clears throat> and uh, I read it. What a mistake. Um, it was, uh, I was, I was truly, truly um, blown away. And then the second one, I couldn't put it down, so I read the second one on the immortality of the soul. And I was thrown into a crisis. <clears throat> um, I realized Newman had me by the throat, and there wasn't much I could do. So, uh, I, but the thing is, there were no other Christians in the graduate school in Columbia, to be honest with you. The only guy I knew was a Wisconsin Synod Lutheran minister. Now, if you know anything about the Wisconsin Synod, you know that they make fun of Catholics. I mean, these guys dress up and do, you know, Pope and Bishop mockery contests. And Glenn and I, I knew him because we were in a fourth century Christianity class. 
in which an Oxford professor was trying to convince us all that Christianity in the late fourth century with Ambrose and Augustine and those guys was overrated, and that the pagan revival was sorely underrated. So Glenn and I were, we were in this class together, and I knew from his comments in the class that he took Christianity seriously. So I went over to him, and he said, well, this is, this is, you've got to do something about this. I teach Latin up at, at uh, uh, Corpus Christi up the street, and the pastor up there named uh, Miles Burke. You ought to go see him since you used to be a Catholic. So anyway, to make a long story short, I went to see Father, Father Miles Burke. Jack's name, well, Jack, I call my oldest son Jack. He's John Henry Miles Clark. Uh, and uh, let's see, I had one of those confessions when you haven't gone to confession for 25 years or whatever. This was a long time. So Newman, Newman was a powerful, powerful uh, inspiration for me. And I owe, really, I, I think I owe... Um, uh, uh, my Catholic faith to Newman, and I'm, I'll be forever grateful for that. Well, that started me reading Hen John Henry Newman, so I just started reading Newman. I read Newman for years and years and years. Now, I'm not a Newman scholar. I know a bunch of Newman scholars. I happen to be friends with a bunch of them. Uh, so it's a pleasure, actually, to come talk about Newman and conversion. And I thought, well, I could talk about Newman and Newman's conversion. Right? And I could give you a 40-minute 40, 40 talk about that, and that's pretty exciting and all that. But it's Lent, and I thought, given what Newman did for me, uh, I think what I'll do is I'll talk a bit about Newman's own conversion, just so you have an idea of who he was, when he lived, uh, about his remarkable life, a little bit of background. And then I picked out two sermons from the plain and parochial sermons to give you an idea of, of the power of, of his preaching and, and uh, of what a huge figure he is in Catholicism. Uh, so, a little bit of background. Newman, Newman was born, I, I believe, 1801. That's my, it's fuzzy in my memory, but 1801, 1800, right at the turn of the century. And uh, grew up in a family that was otherwise unremarkable. But he tells, this is a book that you should read at some point. It's called The Apologia Pro Vita Sua. And uh, it is, uh, to say it's a classic is an understatement. What it is, it's a history of Newman's he wrote his own autobiography, but an autobiography of his religious views and opinions, right? So uh, it's often compared to St. Augustine's Confessions, right, which is the famous, the famous uh, autobiographical account of, of his spiritual journey of Augustine. Um, this is, it's a little bit odd. He tells you nothing about his, his early life, his early childhood. He starts off right away telling you in the first couple of pages about his conversion and just... Um, just to give you an idea of how the book starts, he's on the page one, and he says, let's see, I was brought up from a child to take great delight in reading the Bible, but I had no formed religious convictions till I was 15. That would be 1816, by my account. Of course, I had a perfect knowledge of my catechism. Now, this is an unusual kid, right? He, he, he has perfect knowledge of his catechism. Uh, he's, he's read the Bible. He delights in reading the Bible. But he had no formed religious opinions. Okay, So he's already starting from a place that would be strange for many kids, right? even many young Catholic, Catholic, Catholic people. I'd be delighted if my kids could write that paragraph. <laughs> I'd, be absolutely, I'd be absolutely delighted. Uh, and, uh, but then he, uh, when he was 15... He had a conversion. Now, what, what does that mean? The formed religious opinions. It meant that Newman first really had insight into uh, creedal religion, into, into beliefs, the dogmas that would affect his life, things to live by, right? He says, when I was 15, a great change of thought took place in me. I fell under the influences of a definite creed and received into my intellect impressions of dogma, which through God's mercy have never been effaced or obscured. Okay, and then he goes through a number of doctrines that he learned. Um, and what he basically came to because of a gifted preacher and teacher that he was exposed to was Calvinism. Okay, how many of you know uh, a good deal or even a bit about Calvinism? Okay, good. Well, I'm going to give you, <clears throat> Newman gives a, a little, a, a, a brief paragraph of praise of what he would consider, this, I remember he's writing in the first part of the 19th century, um, and he's someone who really re reads carefully, right? So he read, um, he read Calvin, he read, uh, he read a lot of the, the English writers who were writing on Calvin, he says, 
Calvinists make a sharp separation between the elect and the world. There is much in this that is cognate or parallel to the Catholic doctrine, but they go on to say, as I understand them, very different, differently from Catholicism, that the converted and the unconverted can be discriminated by man, that the justified are conscious of their state of justification, and that the regenerate cannot fall away. Catholics, on the other hand, shade and soften the awful antagonism between good and evil, which is one of their dogmas, by holding that there are different degrees of justification, that there's a great difference in point of gravity between sin and sin, that there is the possibility and the danger of falling away, and that there is no certain knowledge given to anyone that he is simply in a state of grace, and much less that he is to persevere to the end. Of the Calvinistic tenets, the only one which took root in my mind was the fact of heaven and hell, divine favor and divine wrath of the justified and unjustified. So he was a Calvinist. Now he was a Calvinist until he got to Oxford. Newman uh, is, is he's truly an intellectual. It's, it's almost impossible. Uh, impossible to state just how great he is. If I, I'm a medieval historian, right? So I, I do medieval question. Oh, I do medieval Catholic theology, right? And the great giant in the 13th century is, is uh, Saint Thomas, of course. And then you go back. There are many, many wonderful and, and, and heroic and, and uh, learned doctors of the church. But over the over the over the course of time, certain giants to stand out, and Augustine and Thomas are two of those, right? Since Saint Thomas, I'd have to say that, that Newman is is another giant, stands bestriding modernity like a colossus. Now, his he, he he's a giant in so many ways, um, but one of the ways that he was a giant is when he got to Oxford, he won this won these enormous Latin prizes. He actually became part of, of, a, of, he became a leader in a movement led by the brightest lights at Oxford on the faculty. At that time at Oxford, every faculty member was a clergyman, right? And so he led what was called the Oxford Movement, right? And the Oxford Movement brought back huge numbers of the best and brightest in England to really sincere high Anglicanism. I mean, the highest, just absolutely the best you could possibly imagine. It was as close to the Catholic Church. In fact, in Newman's mind, it probably was the Catholic Church. He brought them back, and it was tremendously controversial. But imagine, if you will, uh, it would be the equivalent right now. Imagine a faculty member. Well, I, I don't want to say, I, let's say Princeton. Harvard. Imagine that you had a faculty member at Princeton or Harvard who was also a clergyman who's preaching at a neighborhood, pre neighborhood church drew all the undergraduates, drew them all. And they all started to take religion seriously, right? This is the best and brightest in the whole land. Harvard or Princeton, just picture them, right? And they all start going to church. Not only that, they start going to church. They start going to church during the week. They start practicing sacramental religion. And suddenly, whatever the language of Harvard, whatever the religion of, of Harvard or Princeton is, becomes again virtually like a national, well, you have to go back centuries in the United States to when that was true, right? Well, Newman did that. Then what happened was cataclysmic for England, right? I'm going on a bit too much because I really want to get to his sermons, but to give you some idea of what happened, Newman had read deeply in the Fathers. In fact, if you're interested in the Fathers of the Church, his history of the Arians in the 4th century, based on his readings in the Fathers, and especially Athanasius, is still worth reading. Right? If you're a scholar... That's a book that you still read. Right? Now, this is written by an amateur right, in the early part of the 19th century. Right? And it is still, if you're a patristic specialist, Mike, one of my closest friends is, a, uh, is the top patristics guy in the United States. He's Greek patristics chair at Notre Dame, Father Brian Daly, a wonderful Jesuit. And uh, he would tell you that what I'm saying is true. Right? You, if you're going to study patristic thought, you're going to study the 4th century Newman is something you have to read. Now, it's not necessarily right in all, in all its respects, but it's very important. So he read deeply in the Fathers, and what happened was, inexorably, he was led to the precipice of the Catholic Church. Now imagine the leader of this great movement recalling everybody to great Protestantism suddenly becoming a Catholic, right? And it wasn't suddenly. He agonized over this for a long time, but he became a Catholic. Now, how heroic that was cannot be Cannot, can hardly be explained because here is this great giant shining light in the Protestant world, right? Who becomes a Catholic and is accordingly severely mistrusted by the Catholics. 
<laughs> you couldn't have a worse pedigree than to be the shining light of Anglicans, right? And so he suffered. Newman suffered greatly. He suffered. I mean, no, he was a man who was, who was sensitive in temperament, but became a Catholic, and to his dying day, he insisted the greatest single grace God had ever given him out of a lifetime of incredible high achievements was his Catholic faith. And of course, near the end of his life, he was made a cardinal. It seemed like if you live, it seems like if you live long enough, you know, all your enemies die out, and you, uh, you, win, you win the day. And I don't know if that's the right explanation, but uh, some people might argue that. But that's what happened to Newman. So now he became, when he became a Catholic, he became an oratorian. How many of you know anything about the oratory of Saint Philip Neri? Okay, well, Philip Neri is one of my shining heroes, too. Philip Neri is a, he's the apostle to Rome in the 16th century. He brought Rome back to Catholicism, much as Newman brought England back to Christianity. Well, Newman became an oratorian. He taught and he wrote. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he accomplished great things. But tonight I thought what I would do, it's Lent. So I've told you a little bit about my, my little conversion. I've told you about Newman's conversion, but I thought I would let Newman speak to us about what conversion really means. Now, at this point, uh, <coughs> fasten your seatbelts. I remember when I, when, I, when, I, when I got married a few years later, uh, and I was, of course, so excited about Newman, I, I handed this volume to my wife and said, you have to read this. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, she handed it back and she said, I'm not ready for that yet. <laughs> she said, I mean, are all his sermons like that? <laughs> I think it's true. So, but I thought rather than just give it, give you all the bad news, I thought I would give one. Newman is there. There are a number of themes that, if you read widely in Newman, you can't help but avoid. Um, one of them is the difference between sort of false or worldly religion and real religion. And to Newman, the difference between those two things is as high as heaven above earth. Uh, uh, so, what a truly religious man would be. Uh, the, other, the other theme he talks about is that holiness is the work of a lifetime. Right? And if you start out, as I did, you know, going backwards in the race, right? And you're going, it takes a, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real, it's a huge undertaking and not one to be undertaken lightly. True freedom, what true freedom is. But Newman doesn't just set the bar at 10 feet high and say jump over it, right? So I thought tonight I would give you one of the sermons that talk about just how high that bar is, what real conversion means. And then I thought we would read a bit in another one that tells us how to get there. And fittingly, um, since we're right smack at this point in Lent, I picked one of the sermons that he gave right at this point in Lent to a congregation on meditation. So the first one is entitled, The Strictness of the Law of Christ. Okay, <clears throat> he always starts his sermons off with a quotation from scripture. In this case, it's from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. Being then made free from sin, ye became the slaves of righteousness. Okay? Now, I could paraphrase all this, and that would do great injustice to Newman. I'm not going to read you the whole, but I'm going to read excerpts from the sermon. I want you to get a feeling for just how powerful this is. Okay? So I'm going to comment a little bit in between. But basically, I'd rather you have Newman and have me glossing than the other way around. Okay? <laughs> So, in the passage of which these words form a part, St. Paul insists again and again on the great truth which they declare that Christians are not their own, but bought with a price, and as such are become the slaves of God. And this upon their being rescued from the state of nature. The great apostle is not content with speaking half the truth. He does not merely say that we are set free from guilt and misery, but he adds that we have become the slaves of Christ. We were by nature slaves to sin. We are bought by the blood of Christ. We do not cease to be slaves. Now that in itself is a pretty, pretty tough opening to a sermon, right? Uh, especially in a society in which the notion of slavery is not an attractive one, right? He says, no, make no mistake. Christians are slaves. He says, this needs insisting on, and I'm going to, I'm going to skip, skip, skip ahead as needed, for a number of persons who are not unwilling to confess that they are slaves by nature, uh, uh, deny, right, have they learned to think that they are not bound to any real services at all now that Christ has set them free. 
Now, if by the word slavery we mean some cruel and miserable state of suffering, such as human masters often inflict on their slaves, in that sense, indeed, Christians are not slaves, and the word is improperly applied. But if by being slaves is meant that we cannot throw up our service, change our place, and do as we will, in that sense, it is literally true. That we are more than slaves to Christ. Okay? Men often speak, and this is one of his themes, you'll find it in all his sermons, even his Catholic sermons. He says this again and again and again. Men often speak as if the perfection of human happiness lay in our being free to do or not to do to choose or to reject, right? And that's a definition of freedom I think we'd all recognize, mm -hmm. right? It's the one that's current. In fact, that's what got me in that, for this is an aside, but what got me in that first sermon, uh, holiness necessary for future blessedness, one of the things he said is that the person who was, who was used to his own will would be miserable in heaven, right? Because in heaven you do God's will, right? And so if you're used to doing your own will, you're not even going to want to be in heaven, right? And I thought, he's absolutely right. My goodness, how right he is. So it's a theme he comes back to. So he says, we may choose our master, but God or mammon we must serve. We cannot possibly be in a neutral or intermediate state. Such a state does not exist. If we will not be Christ's slaves, we are forthwith Satan's. And Christ set us free from Satan only by making us his servants. Satan's kingdom touches upon Christ's. The world touches on the church. Okay, so you see where he's going uh, with this. So then he says, religion then is a necessary service. And this is another theme. In what, what, in what does true religion consist? Right? It is a privilege too, but it becomes more and more of a privilege the more we exercise ourselves in it. And this, I think, is, is ultimately when I realized... Uh, that what I'm going to now read a passage from him that I think would be his definition of true conversion. Okay, What does it mean to be truly converted? The perfect Christian state is that in which our duty and our pleasure are the same. When what is right and true is natural to us and in which God's service is perfect freedom. Okay, So how do we get there? Right? It's not God's service that's going to change. We have to change. Right? So we, to get there, we have to be we have to be changed, right? And so he says, and again, here's one of the themes I mentioned: holiness being the work of a lifetime. We still have that old nature to subdue. We have a work, a conflict all through life. We have to master and bring under all we are, all we do expelling all disorder and insubordination and teaching and impressing on every part of us of soul and body its due place and duty till we are holy Christ's in will, affections, and reason as we are by profession. Well, that's a high standard. Right? It's what Pope John Paul II called the life of the ordinary Catholic. Right? It's a very high standard. Right? But it takes work to get there. Okay. Then he goes, he says, this is independent of the standard of obedience that we set for ourselves. But here's the question. What is the sort of man, now this is the man who's religious in the world. What is the sort of man whom the world accounts respectable and religious? What is that man? At best, he is such as this. Now this is where the, the shivers go down my spine whenever I read these parts, right? Because I see how high this standard is and you start to measure yourself. Well, that's the whole point, right? And I do feel okay giving any of these sermons because it's Lent. So, <laughs> As my wife pointed out, he seems to preach as if it's always Lent, which is probably true. <laughs> so at best he is such as this. He has a number of good points in his character. Some of these he has by nature. And if others have been acquired by trouble, it is either because outward circumstances compelled him to acquire them, or that he has from nature some active principle within him, which has exerted itself and brought other principles under and rules him. He has acquired a certain self-command, because no one is respected without it. He has been forced into habits of diligence, punctuality, precision, and honesty. This is a pretty good guy, right? Someone you might want to hire. He is courteous and obliging, and has learned not to say all he thinks and feels, or to do all he wishes to do on all occasions. 
The great mass of men, of course, are far from having in them so much that is really praiseworthy as this, but I am supposing the best. Okay? I am supposing the best. I am supposing, then, that a man's character and station are such that only now and then will he feel his inclinations or his interests to run counter to his duty. Okay? So the 99 times he'll do the right thing. But the one time when it, when it might be necessary, it goes against it, he won't. All right? <clears throat> all right. For instance, he generally comes to church. It is his practice. Okay? Again, he is strictly honest in his dealings. He speaks the truth. That is, it is his rule to do so. But if hard-pressed, he allows himself now and then in a falsehood, falsehood particularly if it is, slight, as it is a slight one. He knows he should not lie. He confesses it. But he thinks it cannot be helped. It is unavoidable from circumstances. Okay, etc. He has learned to curb his temper and his tongue. But on some unusual provocation, they get the better of him. He becomes angry, says what he should not, perhaps curses and swears. Are not all men subject to be overtaken with anger or ill temper? That is not the point. The point is this, that he does not feel compunction afterward. He does not feel that he has done anything which needs forgiveness. Once more, he is in general sober and temperate. But he joins a party of friends and makes merry. He is tempted to exceed. Next day, he says that it is a long time since such a thing happened to him. It is not at all his way. He hardly touches wine or the like in common. Now, I'm reading this, of course, and I see myself. You guys have the great advantage of uh, private, you know, secretum me, right? <laughs> secretum me. You're allowed to keep your secrets. I'm up here talking about Newman, and my secrets are his in some way. But I think we can all recognize to some extent, right, this we would think very, this is a person who would look to all, to all of us as, as someone perhaps highly religious, perhaps even pious, right? Okay. And now I suppose you quite understand what I mean, and I need not say more in explanation. Okay? Such men being thus occasionally indulgent to themselves or indulgent to each other, they make allowance for all around them. This is the secret of being friends with the world, to have a sympathy and share in its sins. Those who are strict with themselves are strict with the world. But where men grant themselves a certain license of disobedience, they do not draw the line very rigidly as regards others. Okay? They learn to say that the private habits of their neighbors are nothing to them. And they hold intercourse with them only as public men, or members of society, or in the way of business, not at all as with responsible beings having immortal souls. They desire to see and know nothing but what is on the surface. And they call a man's personal history sacred because it, because it is sinful. In their eyes, and I'm reading this just because it's remarkable how close this is to much of the world we today, right? In their eyes, their sole duty to their neighbor is not to offend him. Whatever his morals, whatever his creed, is nothing to them. Such are they in mature and advanced life. In youth, they are pliable as well as indulgent, they readily fall in with the ways of the world as they come across them. They are and they have the praise of being pleasant, good-tempered, and companionable, etc. Very impressive, okay? Now, to the other theme that I mentioned, right? <clears throat> freedom. What's true freedom? Such men as these have the world at will. They are free. Alas, what a melancholy freedom. Yet, in one sense, a freedom it is. A religious man must withdraw his eyes from sights which inflame his heart, recollecting our Savior's caution. But a man of the world thinks it no harm to gaze where he should not, because he goes no further. A religious man watches his words, but the other utters whatever his heart prompts and excuses himself for profane language on the plea that he means nothing by it. He goes on and on and on and on. He talks about politics. Okay. These are a few out of a multitude of traits which mark an easy religion, the religion of the world, which would cast in its lot with Christian truth, were not that truth so very strict, and quarrels with it and its upholders, not as if it were not good and right, but because it is so unbending. Right? Isn't that the argument against it? That it seems too severe, that it's impossible. Right? Religion, it would be unnatural. Right? It would be unnatural to be that severe. Okay. But the Apostle Paul knew that the world would not think so, and therefore he insists on it. Right? 
He cited St. Paul to begin. Newman will tell you that you can never, ever plumb the depths of the scriptures. Right? You can spend a lifetime studying, reading, praying with them, never get to the bottom. And he takes them deadly seriously. Therefore it is that he insists on the necessity of Christians fulfilling the righteousness of the law. Remember, just it was just the gospel a few days ago. The, 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 I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, right? Mm-hmm. Fulfilling it because till we aim at complete, unreserved obedience in all things, we are not really Christians at all, as you fall over backwards with me. Right? St. James says, Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. And our Savior assures us that whosoever shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And except our righteousness succeed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, we shall in no way enter into the kingdom of heaven. Okay? And then he talks about the young man who came to Jesus and had kept all the commandments, but was, was unwilling to do the one thing needful. Now he comes to what shall we do? He says, let us not then deceive ourselves. Okay? What God demands us, of us is to fulfill his law, or at least to aim at fulfilling it. To be content with nothing short of perfect obedience. To attempt everything. To avail ourselves of the aids given us and throw ourselves not first but afterwards on God's mercy for our shortcomings. This is, I know, at first hearing, a startling doctrine. And so averse are our hearts to it that some men even attempt to maintain that it is an unchristian doctrine. Okay? A forlorn expedient indeed with the Bible to refer to and its statements about the straight gate and the narrow way. People appeal to Scripture to refute this this view. They appeal to common sense. And as I said... um, They even appeal to nature, right? It's unnatural. But Newman says it is religion itself that we dislike by nature, if this is what religion means, not the excess merely. Okay, so what are we going to do about this? He says, heaven cannot change. Oh, here we go. Let us then see where we stand and what we must do. So this, I take it, is the map for conversion. Heaven cannot change. God is without variableness or shadow of turning. His, quote, word endureth forever in heaven. His law is from everlasting to everlasting. We must change. We must go over to the side of heaven. Okay? Never had a soul true happiness but in conformity to God, in obedience to his will. And in a side, St. Philip, by the way, one of his great sayings was, there's no recreation. There is no recreation apart from it fidelity to God. So what appears to be recreation is not true recreation. We must become what we are not. We must learn to love what we do not love and practice ourselves in what is difficult. We must have the law of the spirit of life written and set up in our hearts that the righteousness of the law may may be fulfilled in us and that we may learn to please and to love God. Okay. We Christians are indeed under the law as other men, but as I have already said, it is the new law, the law of the Spirit of Christ. We are under grace. That law, which to nature is a grievous bondage, is to those who live under the power of God's presence, what it was meant to be, a rejoicing. When then we feel reluctant to serve God, when thoughts rise within us as if he were a hard master, and that his promises are not attractive enough to balance the strictness of his commandments, let us recollect that we as Christians are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, and let us act on the conviction of it. Let us go to him for grace. Let us seek his face. Let us come where he gives grace. Let us come to the ordinances of grace in which Christ gives his Holy Spirit to enable us to do that which by nature we cannot do and to become the servants of righteousness. They who pray, and he never left those youthful hearers at Oxford uh, feeling as if they couldn't do it. He always gave them right at the end what they needed to do. They who pray for his saving help to change their likes and their dislikes, their tastes, their views, their wills, their hearts, do not indeed all at once gain what they seek. They do not gain it at once asking. They do not perceive they gain it while they gain it. But if they come continually day by day to him, 
if they come humbly, if they come in faith, if they come not as a trial how they shall like God's service, but throwing, as far as may be, their whole hearts and souls into their duty as a sacrifice to Him, if they come not seeking a sign, but determined to go on seeking Him, honoring Him, serving Him, trusting Him, whether they see light or feel comfort or discern their growth or no, such will gain, though they know it not. They will find, even while they are still seeking. Before they call, he will answer them, and they will, in the end, find themselves wondrously saved, to their surprise, how they know not, and when their crown seemed at a distance. They that wait on the Lord, says the prophet, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. And that is the end of his sermon on the strictness of the law of Christ. <clears throat> So you get a sense, a real sense, of the high ideals Newman has. Now, we're going to end with a couple of prayers and meditations, but I want to read just a little bit from the, the sermon that he gave for this coming Sunday in Lent. Okay? It's called Christ's Privations, a Meditation for Christians. And he starts off with St. Paul again. Ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Okay. As time goes on, and now I see myself, so I see this so clearly in this sermon, and so many, so many of us do, I thought, this is the way. This is the tangible, practical, right? If someone asks me, Right. If anybody, in fact, uh, this has been the, the preaching at the college of the, of the chaplains has been on this very subject for a number of weeks. As time goes on and Easter draws near, we are called upon not only to mourn our sins, but especially over the various sufferings that Christ our Lord and Savior underwent on account of our sins. Why is it, my brethren, that we have so little feeling on the matter as we commonly have? Why is it that we are used to let the season of Lent come and go just like any other season, not thinking more of Christ than at other times, or at least not feeling more? Am I not right in saying that this is the case? And if so, have I not cause for asking why it is the case? We are not moved when we hear of the bitter passion of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, for us. We neither bewail our sins which caused it, nor have any sympathy with it. We do not suffer with him. If we come to church, we hear, and then we go away, not distressed at all, or if distressed, only for the moment. And many do not come to church at all. They eat, they drink, they sleep, and rise up, and go about their business and their pleasure during the season, just as usual. They do not carry the thought of him who died for them, along with them. With them, they in no sense live, to use St. Paul's words, by the faith of the Son of God, who loved them and gave himself for him. This, alas, cannot be denied. Yet if it be so that the Son of God came down from heaven, put aside his glory, and submitted to be despised, cruelly treated, and put to death by his own creatures, by those whom he had made, and whom he had preserved up to that day, and was upholding in life and being, is it reasonable that so great an event should not move us? Well, clearly, it's not, right? And yet Newman points out that I know that it's true of myself. Right? You go through your daily business, right? Even, um, you, I, I have, I'm at the college, so I, I have the great good fortune of being able to, to go to a daily mass, right? The 1130 mass, my kids and family live down the street. They come join me. It's terrific. I go in there. I recollect myself. If I'm lucky, after the morning's classes, I walk out. Boom! I'm hit with life, right? And then I go from that until maybe after the kids are in bed at 830. Right? Not having given a second thought to, uh, to, to what I was hearing in church and what I was feeling at the time. Right? So, does it not stand to reason that we must be in a very irreligious state of mind unless we have some gratitude, some sympathy, some little love, some little awe, some little self-reproach, some little self-abasement, some little repentance, some little desire of amendment? Okay. Now, what are we going to do about it? That's what he, that's what he gives us the sermon on what can we do. Here it is. Why is this? Why do we so little understand the gospel of our salvation? Why are our eyes so dim and our ears so hard of hearing? Why do we have so little faith, so little of heaven in our hearts? For this one reason, my brethren, if I must express my meaning in one word, 
Because we so little meditate. You do not meditate, and therefore you are not impressed. What is meditating on Christ? It is simply this, thinking habitually and constantly of Him and of His deeds and sufferings. It is to have Him before our minds as one whom we may contemplate, worship, and address when we rise, when we lie down, when we eat and drink, when we are at home and abroad, when we are working or walking or at rest, when we are alone, and again, when we are in company. This is meditating. And by this, and nothing short of this, will our hearts come to feel as they ought. So he goes on through this, and I'm not going to go through this sermon. But he goes through this sermon and gives his hearers a map of what meditation means, right? Will meditation change us instantly? If we think on this, if we, if we think on the various episodes in the gospel, if we think about Christ as we go about our daily business, will it change us instantly? No. Will it change us inevitably, gradually over time? No doubt. Because it changes our hearts. And I will... <coughs> Um, he goes through all the sufferings of Christ, right? As, as subjects for meditation. And then, uh, but I want to read the end of it again. His perorations are used in our magnificent. He says, <clears throat> How little are our sorrows compared to these, talking about Christ, right? We cannot indeed thus feel what we should merely because we wish and ought so to feel. We cannot force ourselves into so feeling. I do not exhort this man or that man so to feel, since it's not in his power. We cannot work ourselves up into such feelings. Deep feeling is but the natural or necessary attendant on a holy heart. But though we cannot at our will thus feel, and all at once, we can go the way thus to feel. We can grow in grace till we thus feel. Meditation. And meanwhile, we can observe such an outward abstinence from the innocent pleasures and comforts of life as may prepare us for feeling the right way. We may meditate upon Christ's sufferings, and by this meditation we shall gradually, as time goes on, be brought to these deep feelings. We may pray God to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, to make us feel, to give us the spirit of gratitude, love, reverence, self-abasement, godly fear, repentance, holiness, and lively faith. Okay? So, that's Newman's preaching. And he also has books of sermons, of course, after he was a Catholic. He was a Catholic for a very long time, right? Those sermons are beautiful, but you get some idea of the power of his preaching, right? And of his understanding of human psychology. Now, lest you think that Newman was, was unrelentingly uh, dour, I thought that I would end uh, my little presentation with... Um, a couple of his meditations. This is a book of his meditations and devotions, which is really wonderful. Uh, everything in here is is uh, is worth considering. But um, I thought I would read a, a short a short meditation called "A Short Road to Perfection." Right? Um, it seems it sounds like a funny title. Yeah. <laughs> really? Sure. I don't know. It's like it's true. All right. It is the saying of holy men that if we wish to be perfect, we have nothing more to do than to perform the ordinary duties of the day well. A short road to perfection, short not because easy, but because pertinent and intelligible. There are no short ways to perfection, but there are sure ones. I think that this is an instruction which may be of great practical use to persons like ourselves. It is easy to have vague ideas of what perfection is, which serve well enough to talk about when we do not intend to aim at it. But as soon as a person really desires and sets about seeking himself, he is dissatisfied with anything but, but what is tangible and clear and constitutes some sort of direction towards the practice of it. I know I am, right? You want to have a real roadmap. You want to have a sure guide. We must bear in mind what is meant by perfection. It does not mean any extraordinary service, anything out of the way, or especially heroic. Not all have the opportunity of heroic acts of sufferings. But it means what the word perfection ordinarily means. By perfect, we mean that which has no flaw in it, that which is complete. That which is consistent, that which is sound. We mean the opposite to imperfect. As we know well what imperfection in religious service means, we know by the contrast what is meant by perfection. 
He then is perfect, who does the work of the day perfectly. And we need not go beyond this to seek for perfection. You need not go out of the round of the day. I insist on this because I think it will simplify our views and fix our exertions on a definite aim. If you ask me what you are to do in order to be perfect, I say first, do not lie in bed beyond the due time of rising. <laughs> not that I have a choice, not with my kids. <laughs> Give your first thoughts to God. Make a good visit to the Blessed Sacrament. Say the Angelus devoutly. Eat and drink to God's glory. Say the rosary well. Be recollected. Keep out bad thoughts. Make your evening meditation well. Examine yourself daily. Go to bed in good time and you are already perfect. <laughs> so I thought I would end with uh, a bit of a... Uh, to show that it's not all, not all rocks and chains. So. That's it. I know some of you that uh, live a long ways away said we're on a tornado watch. The weather looks fine, but if you, uh, we'll give a 60 second break in case anybody does need to head home and get out of here before we have bad weather. I don't know. So feel free to stand up, take a 60 second break. If you need to leave, there's the door. Otherwise, uh, have a little more soup and then we'll have just a few questions for Dr. Clark. Back
So, um, you know, any, any, there, there are numerous, it's written about all the time. There's probably you know, five really good biographies available. And any of those would have, would, would talk about that. I've read a number of them, but it was years and years ago, so I don't remember. But I, I do remember this, that, that he took many of those people that he had brought to the high practice of Anglicanism with him to the Catholic Church. Yes, ma'am. That's okay, go ahead. Um, I was going to make a comment that um, I too came back to the Catholic Church um, after being away for 20 years. And um, I think I, I asked those very same questions and sentiments that um, you know, Bishop Newman had asked those questions, uh, written those words. And I came, for me, I see for myself, I think it's a love affair. And I look back in my own life and how I've gone in and out of love, gotten married, you know, and was in a love affair. And that's what it is. It's a, it's a love affair. And if you're not in love with God, then who is he? And what draws you to him except when disaster or when you've been fulfilled with the earthly and material goods? And then you say, okay, what more is there in life? And for me, I said, ah, oh, it's the spiritual thing. I've accomplished all the material goods. Now it's a spiritual thing. So now, you know, anyway, that's my feeling. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. I don't know how relevant this is, but I'm curious. Did he ever do any political writings or make any comments about American philosophy, the founders themselves? You know, he's famous. This is a very good question. He's famous. Uh, there, it work, we commonly use the words conservative and liberal in political contexts. Newman, the back of the Apologia, has a, has a tremendously famous and important document uh, on uh, um, what liberalism is. And by liberalism, he meant the doctrine or the notion that um, belief doesn't matter. Okay? That what people believe does not matter. And I would, uh, I would refer you, um, I don't want to go, go through it now, but it would be a, a great place for you to go to read, right? In sense, did, is, it a, is it a treatise on a specific uh, political position or something like No, but I think it's pretty much the, the insight into all politics of the modern world, right? The notion, and it, it's applicable in so many different spheres, but he anticipated what's become a plague, right? Um, think about higher education institutions of religion, right? One by one, all the Protestant ones have given up their, 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 their affiliations, and many Catholic ones are seemingly on the road to the same thing. So. Well, I, I only ask because just having reverted or taken it seriously in the past 10 years, in the past couple of years, when it comes to just the basic American ideal, I think it's essentially in, inimical to the Catholic mind because it seems to be the, the Protestant ethos as a national and public philosophy. Hmm. Well, I don't think, he wouldn't have commented on that so specifically. <coughs> but he would be more, Newman was a, a deep and great thinker, so he, he was always more concerned with principles, right? He, he might have, his thought might have uh, uh, some effect on that. Certainly he understands the difference. He well understood the difference between the Catholic mind and the Protestant mind, right? Between he, better than anybody, I think. Because he had he had tried to rewrite the Anglican principles to make it you know, to make it Catholic, the Anglican bishops rejected it, virtually forcing him and many others out of the church. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I'm just curious why you think his canonization process may, has taken so long. I mean, I think he's better now. Boy, if I knew, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, here's here would be my answer to that. If they counted his miracles, uh, uh, moral conversions. Uh, he would have been canonized a long time ago. Um, but uh, I, I leave that, that judgment to those who are in a position to make. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I suppose it's, uh, you've got to have a certain number of authenticated uh, miracles, right? So. And would you share more about when do you, um, when you convert to Catholic? When I came back to Catholic. Back and what really, what the, what was... What are the key thoughts that, that, that really drive you to that? And what, what is attracted you that to do? You know, to be honest, I, I honestly, was in, I was in a state of terror. I mean, after reading those two sermons, I literally, I got down on my knees, and I was, I, if I could pray, I did pray. Right? I'm not even sure what I did was prayer, but I tried. 
And uh, I was truly afraid. Newman made me, re he made me think down to what I really thought. And the thing that really got me was I had to decide whether I believed in the immortality of the soul. Right? And when it became clear to me that I actually did, right? I mean, Aristotle makes convincing arguments for the immortality of the soul, and I knew them well. Uh, once I realized that, I knew I was really in trouble. Um, and, so, uh, and so then, if your soul was immortal and you were living like I was, I mean, that's just terror. So um, I, it was nothing great or beautiful or fancy. I was literally scared to death. And uh, when I went up to... Uh, uh, and it's... Uh, uh, how do you put this? It's one of those things you, you, uh, you, you go, I went to confession and I thought that was great, right? And I felt terrific and then I realized, you know, you're, it takes a long time to escape bad habits, right? So that process is, you know, I think about that question all the time. It's no longer out of terror, it's more out of you know, love and attraction, right? It, it becomes much more attractive as time goes on, right? That's only because maybe I'm changing a little bit more towards heaven, right? Does that answer your question? Any others? Have yes, you heard Scott Allen ever said Allen had a discussion about your conversion? We haven't. You have or have We have not. Oh. No. 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 And I'm glad that he's in the public sphere and I'm not. <laughs> that was a difference though, right? You're a reaver. I'm a reaver. Yeah. I came back. Yeah, you know, I was, I think in some case, in some senses, my experience was typical, but people in my generation, our, our formation, you know, my parents were Catholic, but our, our, our Catholicism was, how, how can I describe it? It was, you know, Assume. Huh? Assume. it was just there. We, we went to church, but there, we did, there was no real deep, was there, deep intellectually, yeah. it, there was no real formation of the kind that my wife and I are really trying hard to give to our children. And so, you know, I, I liken it to being swept downstream by a current. You know, it's not as if it was any, look, I think in, in all respects, my experience was typical, except for I was probably worse than most. And, but in this respect, it's atypical. I mean, it's just a tremendous mercy, right? I mean, to actually come back uh, to, to the Catholic, you know, to come back to being, a, you know, striving to lead the life of an ordinary, ordinary Catholic. And of course, I'll tell you, nothing but good things have happened to me since then, right? Meeting my wife, my children. I mean, it's just, it's, it's one undeserved great thing after another. So um, certainly my life is far happier uh, than it ever could have been the other way. So um, God's been very generous. Yes, sir. Um, I was just wondering what, if any, uh, theological errors there are uh, with Cardinal Newman's uh, sermons that he gave to the Protestant, and like, are there any danger spots we should look out for? Oh, and these, that's a really great question, actually, because naturally, you think, here's a guy who, who is not a Catholic theologian, and he would actually differ. Um, the... Uh, there, you know, he's generally speaking pretty honest, and he refutes his own errors as time goes on. So if you're going to read Newman, the way I would read him is, you feel free, you don't have to be, in other words, you don't have to be a professional theologian. I'm not a professional theologian, right? I'm a historian of medieval theology, right? But that doesn't make me a professional theologian, right? And so as Newman went on, right, he was very open about his, uh, his, his the, 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 the the, the changes that his thinking involved, where he thought I was wrong about this, I was wrong about this, and he, in his in his later writings, he he abjures earlier positions, and he's pretty much, you know, it's like the, Augustine wrote a book of retractations, right? Um, Newman probably wrote ten books of retractations. <laughs> but if if we read, if we buy that book of uh, uh, that you have there, this one, uh, the plan and parochial sermon. The one that I told you yes. Yeah. Uh, is there, is there much, can it lead you astray? Is everything uh, safe to read there? Yeah, well, I think it's as safe as it comes, right? If there, there might be the needle in the haystack in here, right? And put it this way. Here's what I would recommend. If you read this and have a question about it, um, ask. Well, since I am not a theologist, I don't, I don't know if what I am going to, I am reading is, a, is a right or not right. I go mm -hmm. to the church. Yeah. I go to church. With, with the exception of just a couple, one or two little things, it is so close as to be in this. Put it this way. Newman read the Greek and the Latin fathers of the church. Right? The great doctors of the church in Greek and in Latin. He was one of the chief translators for that great um, series that they put out at the end of the 19th century, which is still unequal in terms of translations. 
So he almost couldn't help being orthodox, right? So so my look, this is this is this is a, put it, Ignatius Press publishes this book. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. There you go. Um, who's the uh, the priest? Uh, uh, Father Fessio. Father Fessio. Father Fessio. One of them is published. So there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's better than anything I can say. <laughs> so along the same lines. Can you pinpoint when there's the conversion from Calvinism to Anglicanism, and then do you? That has to be a big leap from him to be from him believing that he's part of the elect and choosing to live that way to then believing that you know you could win or lose your salvation. Yeah, that change took place really quickly when he got to the university at Oxford. The Calvinism disappeared. And high Anglicanism, under the influence of Pusey and Keeble, two great and learned Anglicans, two great preachers, writers, theologians, really. I mean, so we're not going to see any of the pre pre Anglican stuff in this book. No, no, no. Well, there, you know, I, I remember a couple of times reading a sermon, thinking, I wonder if that's and we talks. I wonder if that might be a little bit of a remnant, but you don't have to worry about it. This is the, this book of history of his religious thought, and the the, the, the going over to Catholicism. The Blessed Virgin right? was a big stumbling block, right? It took, took a long time, and then uh, Why? there were... Hmm? Why? Because he was a Protestant. Because he was a Protestant. I can't explain that, man. questions, feel free, but I have one last uh, announcement that I forgot to make before. Thank you very much. Thank you.